welcome to the Production Talk podcast with me, Jan of MixArtist.com.au. In this podcast series, we celebrate the modern way of producing music. We want to talk about all things related to songwriting, recording at home and music production. So if you produce your music at home, this is the place to be. Please subscribe and recommend this podcast to all your friends. This is the Production Talk Podcast, Episode 69. Welcome back to another episode of the Production Talk Podcast. At the beginning of this episode, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians of the country that uh, we are meeting on today, the Arakwal people of the Banjulung Nation. And I'd like to honor the First Nations people's culture and connection to land, sea and community. And I'd also like to pay my respects and express my gratitude to elders past, present and emerging. With me today is Mr. Ian Shepard, a British mastering engineer who's worked with people like Deep Purple and the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra. He also runs the Production Advice website and he's the founder of the Dynamic Range Day. He's also the mastermind behind the Perception Plugin by Meter Plugins, which I proudly own and use a lot. Welcome to the podcast. How are you today? I'm good, thanks. It's great to be here. It's fantastic to have you on board. You are based in the United Kingdom. Uh, what's the weather like? It's actually a pretty nice day. It's it's quite windy, but the the sun is out and it's very mild for this time of year. So yeah, it's nice. Okay, not not too miserable. That that's good to know. <laughs> Please introduce yourself and tell us about the early days of your, of your career. What are you doing these days, and how did it all start? Okay, uh, so I'm. A professional mastering engineer. I've been mastering for over 25 years now. Um, I, I started out as a mastering engineer, which is unusual. Um, so, you know, okay. quite often mastering engineers are people who have already had a career as a recording engineer or a mixing engineer or a producer, uh, and they, they kind of come to it later on. I, by chance, you know, straight out of college, applied to a bunch of different studios here in the UK to try and get some work. And as far as I knew, the company that I was applying to was a cassette duplication plant. Um, that was how they were listed in the, the white book, this directory of studios that you could get in the UK. But it turned out that they were a recording and mastering studio. It had been a vinyl pressing plant and then it had pivoted, you know, in the early 90s to CD mastering. Um, so there were four or five studios there. There was a live room with a, a Steinway piano. Um, and I started out pretty much from the beginning as a mastering engineer. So I was trained from, from the ground up, which was kind of unusual. Um, I worked wow. there for 15 okay. years and then left to, to set up my own company, um, doing Blu-ray authoring, DVD authoring, and then the website and the podcast and the plugins and everything else since. Wow. Okay. And did they throw you straight into the deep end or did they train you up? Did you work with clients straight away? Well... Not right away. I was. I guess I would say there was definitely training. Um, Good. And yeah. I. But they. It was very practical. You know, I was co okay. copying and compiling tapes, just straight digital copies. You know, recompiling yeah. stuff for one of the, the the small labels that we we did work for very early on, which mm. was actually great because I got to listen to a huge range of music on this very high quality monitoring that they had available. You know, and I just learned simple stuff like, you know, putting in suitable gaps and, you know, fading out when necessary, um, putting it, you know, logging time codes for the beginnings and ends of songs, because, you know, these days it's all done automatically mm. by computer, but back then it was all entered by hand and saved to the tape. Yep. Um, in terms of working with clients, I don't honestly remember. It wasn't that long. It was a few months um, before I started you know, working on actually audio work for clients, um, not wow. working with clients directly at that stage. That was the case of um, I would be given an album to master that someone else didn't have time to do. And then my work would always get reviewed by one of the other engineers there. Um, mm. So at that time, you had to make a CD master on something called a Umatic tape, which was a big video cartridge um, with these incredibly expensive... Uh, recorders, yeah, you know, hundreds of thousands of pounds yeah. to to make the the master tapes, and they, 
two of the studios there were equipped with those, but my studio wasn't. So initially I was compiling onto digital audio tape, DAT tape, the tiny little um, oh, yeah. digital tapes. I remember those. Yep. Yeah. And those and all tapes... the error codes that came with them. Absolutely, mm. yes. <laughs> and the <laughs> mangled tapes and the, all that, all that <laughs> yeah. stuff. Um, but um, those then got transferred by another engineer in another studio. So everything I did was listened to from beginning to end. So they would pick up, mm. you know, I remember the first thing I did, you know, um, Nick Watson, who now works at Fluid Mastering, kind of came in and said, yeah, it, it's it's good, but it's not right. Um, and I did, the, you know, it had taken me two days to do an album and I had to go through and do the whole thing again. Um, and even after that, there was, oh, there was some tweaks. Um, mm. But, you know, that was a that was actually a fantastic way to learn because I... I was in the deep end in the sense that it was me in a room on my own responsible for what I was doing. But at the same time, I had the safety net of knowing that, you know, any mistakes that I made would be picked up on and that I would get this helpful feedback. And I think uh, probably the first time I got to work with clients was when everyone else was on holiday or, or sick or something, you know, and it was just kind of, <laughs> OK, well, we have this session booked. Can Ian do it? Yes. Mm. And I had sat in on sessions with other engineers at that point, you know, so I had learned, you know, how they handled a session, how they worked with clients, the kind of the procedures, if you like. Um, so, yeah, I, I would say it was a kind of accelerated what? intern process, if you like, you know, not kind mm. of. I mean, I remember I went to visit the BBC studios when I was a student uh, and I had a great time, loved it, went to. I think it was made of ale, the studio there. Um, but the engineer there told me, I, I sat with the tape up at the back of the room, literally just hitting record, stop, logging, tape. And he's like, yeah, I've, I've worked here for about 10 years. You know, the guy at the desk, he'll probably be done in about five years and then I should get a chance at, at running the show. And I remember thinking, I don't want to wait 15 years to get my hands on the faders. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, right. Um, so... You know, it, it wasn't that. You know, that was one extreme, and then I think really mine was at the the other end, where, yeah, I really got into it really quickly and very practically. And you had a fantastic training ground by the sounds of it there. Mm, absolutely, yeah, that's really inspiring. Nice. Today there are so many mastering engineers out there, and you know, there's heaps of experienced people like yourself, and you know, uh, some big names in the industry. But that's among hundreds, if not thousands, of uh, small people. Uh, some of them are. Uh, promise a lot on their websites and uh, they might not have, you know, a lot of experience. From a musician's angle, from a musician who's looking for an experienced mastering engineer, what's the difference? Um, what would one expect from a professional mastering engineer that um, an amateur uh, can't really deliver? That's a really tough question because yeah. honestly, it's very hard to tell from, from the musician's mm. point of view. You know, you can have somebody presenting themselves as highly professional and you would expect a certain level of service. Um, yep. But there's no guarantee of that. And at the same time, you might have somebody whose prices are so low, you think this is too good to be true. It, you know, it must mm. be a bu budget operation. But, you know, the reality is, unlike when I started where you needed literally hundreds of thousands of pounds to to even have the gear for a mastering studio, let alone the, the, the space for it and the, the infrastructure... Um, you know, these days you can literally create a master on a $300 laptop. Um, mm. so, and, and, you know, even the plugins that come included with something like Logic or Cubase or, or Pro Tools or whatever are sufficient to do an excellent job. I'm not going to say that, you know, you can get the same that, as you could get if you went to a top flight professional mastering studio, um, but you can get superb results. Mm. So... I think my advice is always to, for people to try and find somebody they resonate with um, who seems to be accessible, who, who will communicate. So something that happens mm -hmm. occasionally that still surprises me is that someone will have gone to a big-name mastering studio who may have an online portal, you know, and the, the kind of the entry-level price, you don't even get to choose your engineer. Um, and I've had people saying, well, I had my song or my album mastered by this place and i don't really like the way that it sounds can you do something different and i always reply well have you talked to them about it have you gone back and said i'm not really happy with yeah. this result can you please um mm. and sometimes they're reluctant to do that i don't know whether you know they they feel that it's not their place to question some somewhere that has a, a, a brig 
name in the industry, perhaps, or whether they've had that conversation and been discouraged. I've heard stories about, you know, some big name engineers being really quite defensive and kind of saying, well, you know, you, you came to me, this is what I do. If you don't like it, tough. <laughs> um, and, yeah, and right. that to me mm. is is not what you want. You know, if somebody, if I master something for somebody and they come back and say, I'm not quite sure, I want to say, okay, well, let's talk about more about that. Let's figure out why, you know, is that because I'm the wrong person for, for you, for this material, or mm. is there just some... And usually it's a tiny little tweak. You know, I've had people feeling really unhappy yeah, about right. something and it mm. ends up being half a dB at three kilohertz or something, you know, because they're particularly sensitive mm-hmm. to that frequency error. Or it, it can, it's often amazing uh, how sensitive people are. I guess it's not surprising, yeah. right? It's their music. They, they mm. you know, they've worked super hard on it for, for so long and now they're, you know it's going out into the world and they want it to be perfect. So mm. I think, you know, um, I think it's good to have a name that you recognise in some way. And that doesn't have to mean that it's the biggest name in the world. But, you know, ideally somebody who's been recommended or who other people have talked highly of. Um, yeah. If you can get an idea of what they've worked on, you know, if somebody sends gets in touch with me, then I have, um, there's a Spotify playlist, there's a a couple of other pages where they can just hear an example of stuff that I have worked on so they can get a sense of, I mean, it's really hard with mastering because you hardly ever get to hear the mix beforehand, right? So whatever the artists, engineers, producers, everybody else has done, then it gets mastered and that's the version that gets out into the world. So it might have sounded fantastic before mastering and not much happened, or it could have sounded actually a bit rough and the mastering has worked a minor miracle to get it to where it is. Mm-hmm. And as musicians or as, you know, potential clients, we have no way of telling that. So it is really tough. But I think my the, the key, key thing I would say is whoever you're thinking of working with, send them a message um, and get a conversation going, you know, um, okay. because mm. for me, it's all about communication. Um, I mean, I, mm-hmm. you know, if, if somebody genuinely isn't happen, happy with the work that I've done, I would always refund them. You know, I don't want anybody to take anybody's money if they're unhappy but the number of times Mm. that's happened in my career i could count on the fingers of one hand because somebody comes back and says oh it's not quite what i wanted and you have a conversation and you can figure it out um yeah Yeah, right you know Mm. and and i think that for me is how it should work you know i talk to people before they send the stuff in you know um i'm happy to take a listen to an early mix and give a bit of you know feedback kind of say yeah this is this is great but maybe you should consider that. Or if I was going to master this, I'd be concerned about such and such or, Mm -hmm. you know, wanting this. Um, And again, if somebody just sends something in, I will always, or pretty much always do a master of what they have sent because obviously they've been through a kind of a process to get there. And and this is what they've decided is ready for mastering. So I'm not, there Mm -hmm. are some engineers I know who kind of often throw things back and say, no, no, you need to do this, 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 and this. And their clients love that. Um, I'm not that kind of engineer. I tend to try and be humble about it, take what they've got and her, understand where they're trying to go with it, have empathy for what they're trying to mm. achieve and just help it get to the to the next level to be as good as it can be. Um, oh, wow. But That's if, a really good, um, good way. Um, I like that. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, well, no, I was, I was just going to say that if, having said that, if, for example, right now there's, you know, We'll talk about it some more in a minute. There's this trend for everything to be super loud, and that actually often includes the mixes that come in. So quite a common piece of feedback I might have is, this is sounding great, but it's already on the loud side, in my opinion. I would be curious to see if I can get an even better result if I could have the version where you didn't Mm. have that final limiter or that final maximizer or whatever. You know, if that's an experiment you're interested in trying, I would love to give that a go. And sometimes they say, no, no, we're all fine. And sometimes they say, yeah, let's, let's give it a try. Um, Mm, I see. So, you know, that's, that's the way I tend to approach it is I will do my best with what I'm sent. And then if I have some feedback, I'll offer it. um, Cause you know, quite often the master has to be uploaded the following day or go to the CD plant or whatever it is, you know? So, Mm. um, and Mm. then other times people are just, completely sick of it they just want to get it out the door um you know, so, <laughs> yeah, right yeah. yeah it's but i i think yeah sorry that was a long question answer to the question i think communication it, is key yeah, i think yeah, choose somebody yeah. who you you yeah. know you, you can talk to you feel comfortable um that they understand what you're trying to achieve and where well, you've heard some of their work and you're happy with it um mm. and i think all of that is much more important than you know reputation or cost or 
any other factor, really. Okay, thank you. Um, nowadays, we have competition from services that call themselves e-mastering, and you know there are a couple of names around. What's your take on those? Do they deliver acceptable results? Are they good for some clients but not for others? Or you know, what's your take on it? Have, have you looked into those? I have, and not so much recently. I did when they first started coming out, and. I think the answer is it depends. <laughs> the classic audio engineer <laughs> answer to everything. Um, yeah, the so true. I'm uncomfortable with the labeling of them. They call themselves mastering services, you know, and there's some of these sites advertise, you know, get professional results in minutes, that kind of stuff. I'm mm -hmm. uncomfortable with that because for me, mastering, I mean, we were just talking about, it's all about communication. It's a human process, Yeah, you know? Yeah. There is no machine out there that will understand what the emotional intent of your music was, you know, what the message you wanted the, or the emotion you wanted to convey when you wrote the song, when you recorded it, when you performed it. So in the machine's opinion, maybe there's too much bass, but maybe you wanted a dry, hard, brittle sound because you were trying to make kind of feel slightly edgy or uneasy or, you know, it was a song about loneliness and you wanted it to feel empty and desperate or mm. maybe you were just going for the classic sound of something that you know is not as doesn't have as much low end in it these days so in I'm, i'm not comfortable with calling them mastering services however that doesn't mean i think they i have heard things that have been through processes like this that sound fine you know um mm. some that sound pretty good i've tried tests with um things that i've done i, I way back i did a a test where I mastered something myself and then I put the mix through um, one of these things and compared. And I've heard things that are frankly weird. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. You know, just where clearly the, the artificial intelligence didn't understand, in inverted commas, what the song was meant to sound like and did some... You know, there are others that seem to be a much kind of cookie-cutter approach. Everything gets the same treatment. But... Mm -hmm. Having said that, people are using them in very creative ways. So, you know, working with a professional mastering engineer is going to cost some money. Um, using one of these services, depending which ones you try, might be 10 times cheaper than working with a person. So some people are doing mixes, submitting them to these services, listening to the master that comes back and going, okay, well, I kind of like that, but I'm going to tweak it a bit more. Resubmitting it, you know, multiple times. And they end up still yeah, right. spending less money than they would have done with a professional mastering engineer, but they've got something mm. they're happy with. I guess my only concern about that is, you know, one of the most valuable things about mastering is having someone else hear your music in a different listening environment. You know, one of the biggest challenges yes. as, as um, you know, if you're recording and mixing your own stuff, which I know applies to a lot of people these days, you've got the gear you've got, in the room you've got with the headphones or the speakers that you've got and combination of those factors could sound amazing or might actually mm -hmm. sound a bit odd and the problem is you're always going to mix it in your room to sound or on your headphones to sound as good as it possibly can to you but let's say for example just pick, pick an extreme example apple beats headphones super popular super bassy if you mix something yes. to sound balanced eq wise on beats The chances are when you play it back on anything else, especially something like little Apple earbuds in, you know, tiny or, or a phone speaker, it will probably sound bass light because you were hearing more mm -hmm. bass from the headphones yes. than most other systems will give you. It's a bit like if you put it on in a car with a huge, you know, bass bin in the back. Um, That's right. You always get opposite outcome. Exactly. From, um, from what the speakers sound like or the headphones. Yep. Right. Mm -hmm. And the trouble is if all you've got is beats... Mm -hmm. So you do your mix, it yeah. sounds great on Beats, then you upload it to one of these streaming services, uh, not streaming services, the auto-mastering, you know, robot-mastering things. It comes back, you do a couple of tweaks, you send it off again, it still sounds great to you on Beats, but then it goes out into the world. It might sound mm -hmm. wrong to everybody else because it might not have enough bass. So yep. Got it. if you're mm. going to work on your own stuff, which is something that I help people do, you know, on the website and the podcast, because um, lots of people do it and... It's fun and, of course, you know, it's, it's enjoyable and it's another skill. So I encourage mm. that. But if you're going to do that, I always encourage people to have at least one other trusted place to listen. It doesn't have to be super high quality, but it has to be somewhere else that you know really well yeah. um, so that your instincts are reliable. And I say, listen to it somewhere mm -hmm. else. 
if you hear something that kind of makes you think, huh, maybe that's not quite right, make some notes, go back mm. into your mix room or back to your mixing system or mastering system, wherever it is, and listen again. And if you can then hear, oh, maybe that's right, then you can make some adjustments. And, you know, you don't want to listen yeah, to too many places because it just gets horribly confusing. Um, they do want to be places <laughs> that, overwhelming, you, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That, that you know really well um, so that you have an instinct for how it should sound. Um, but even when you do that, it's still you, right? And it, the chances are, if you're recording and mixing your own stuff, you've been working on it for days, weeks, months, years, yes. potentially. Um, and so everything has a story, you know? So you, mm-hmm. you put it on, you go, oh, that kick drum's a bit boomy. Yeah, but that was because of this. And actually, I kind of quite like it. Um, and there's a, there's a temptation to... I guess make an excuse for the way that it sounds or to, yep. you know, make yep. a, make a judgment about it. Whereas someone like me coming to it completely fresh and just saying, okay, if I heard this straight after song X on Spotify, what would I think? We'll just go, okay, mm-hmm. that kick drum's too boomy. You need to deal with that. You know, we need to open yep. out the high yep. end. It's a little bit too, um, too boomy overall and the stereo width needs tightening up, whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. That's something that the mastering engineer can bring to you, which is just this, you know... This fresh perspective. A fresh perspective, yeah. and it's mm. what they do all day, every day. Mm-hmm. And that can be super valuable, and it can be super hard to have that perspective yourself. Um, yep. I mean, again, there, there are ways around it. You know, you can That's take a so rest true. between finishing the mixing. You can give mm. it days or a week or more before you come back to it so that you're hearing And as I say, you can listen on a different system to get a completely different yep. take on it rather than where you recorded and mixed it. So there's, yep. there's definitely stuff that you can do, and it, it it's possible. You know, I, I have people who've taken my courses who go on to become mastering engineers. You know, they get so good at it um, mm-hmm. that, uh, you know, they, they end up, you know, making it part of what they offer to their, to their clients. So it is possible, but it's hard. Um, and that's another mm-hmm. thing that you don't get from the, from the online services, mm-hmm. I don't think. You, know, you get some yep. kind of... I always think it's more like um, you know uh, the what are they called the the wizard things in a in a photo app on a phone. You know, you take a photograph, and it's it was a dull and overcast day, and it's oh, so I'll hit the hit the magic wand button, and oh, it brightens it up, and the colours pop a bit more, and it looks generally better. You know, that's <laughs> that's worth doing. Mm. Is that the best possible version of that photograph? Probably not. If you sent it not. to yeah, a graphic yeah, designer. Yeah. Um, or if it yeah. was a bit of video and you sent it to a, a professional color grader, they would give you an even better version, you know, where the, and you know because maybe it'll over brighten it a bit or it'll blow out some of the the highlights or you know whatever it might be. Mm-hmm. Um, mm. So yeah, another long answer. I think those services Get it. can be useful. They can be valuable. They can be helpful. Some people use them really well and are really happy with them. For me, it's not mastering. Um, mm. It's more like you know a kind of an auto correction tool um yes and that, that's right so yeah mm. it's you know if if, mm. if it works for you then then that's great but mm. i would hope that uh, a human would get an even better result yeah and uh, none of those uh, mastering algorithms have any sense of taste yet <laughs> that's uh, still reserved to us humans and what i also found is that um, you know there's still a value in, in producing eps or albums and that's not something where you know e-mastering servers actually look at how the songs work together By my understanding, they just, you know, apply algorithms to each song individually without considering the song before and after. Yeah, that's a great point. Is, is that, do, do you agree with, with that? Is, is I, that I right? completely agree. Yeah, I'm not aware of any service that yeah. will mm. do anything different if you give it a bunch of songs. Okay. I mean, I guess that will mm. come as well, probably. You know, that'll yeah. be yeah. A, a future enhancement. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, the technology is always progressing. And there definitely are elements of what we do as mastering engineers that are similar for each job you know it's Mm. everything every song on an album i work on separately you know kind of common misconception is that oh mastering is just putting a limiter over the whole thing you know that's Mm -hmm. not what make it loud and bright exactly i mean the cliche (laughs) we we do usually make things somewhat louder and we might make them brighter or warmer or whatever Mm -hmm. that might be if But it yeah. all depends on the material. And you it could easily yeah. be a completely different approach for every song on the album. And that mm-hmm. really is where, okay. where the magic is for me. You know, is, mm. okay, I make some small changes to this song. I make some small changes to this one. This one needs a bit of a bigger change. That one was fine, mm-hmm. but I needed to turn it up 
a ton, and that one mm-hmm. was also fine, but I turned it down slightly. Individually, mm-hmm. those changes may not be that huge, but when you put them all together and they become an album or they go into a playlist, uh, yeah. it can make it can transform things. It's it's kind of amazing um, what mm. you can achieve just with a stereo mix and and some quite simple changes. So yeah, that's another limitation yeah. of the the online services um, right now, at least. Okay, look, uh, you mentioned earlier at the beginning of interview that um, many of the clients of your clients um, partially produce at home or produce at home from beginning to end. Does that make your job harder when when people record and mix themselves at home compared to you know productions that come from a professional studio? Wait for it. It depends. <laughs> um, <laughs> really? <laughs> oh no, absolutely. Some of the some of the worst recordings, genuinely, I've ever heard have come from some of the biggest studios in the world, um, in my opinion. You're not kidding. No, I'm not kidding. Seriously? Um, absolutely. Yeah, I've, I've heard okay. I heard stuff that I would not have allowed. You know, I'm, I'm simple stuff. Like, um, I say that, recordings, yeah, recordings mixes as well, but, I mean, I mainly get to hear masters because it's usually that thing that somebody is not quite happy with what they've got, so they ask me if I can t- give them another kind of perspective on it. Um, but, yeah, I've heard mm. masters where, you know, the left channel was a, one and a half dBs louder than the right. So that the drums and the bass and the vocals all sound like they're not coming out from right between the speakers. You know, the whole mix sounds lopsided. Yeah, right. And that just to me is just fundamentally not right. You know, that's, I, a, that's a huge oversight. Yeah. I think so. Mm. Uh, I mean, I, I guess mm. it's possible that that was a conversation. Well, no, actually, because of the example I'm thinking of where that happened, I corrected it, and the client was like, "Oh yeah, I wonder why they didn't fix that." <laughs> um, mm. You know, so so yeah, I've. I mean, it's not common. Most stuff that comes from professional studios is good. You know, I'm, I'm not okay. uh, tr- yeah. trying to yeah. pretend, but it is true that I've heard really poor quality results from places that you would not expect that from. And some of the best recordings I've heard have been made by people in, in air quotes, bedroom studios. Um, wow. You know, well, I mean, just for example, as a, for as a recent example, you could take the, the Billie Eilish album, um, yep. you know, not the most mm. recent one, but the, The, the first one that kind of went huge for us. She and um, Phineas recorded that literally in his bedroom at their parents' house. Um, it was then professionally mixed, you know, and professionally mastered, so it's not completely clear-cut. But yeah, you, th- there's no clear pattern. Mm-hmm. You can't assume, oh, it's coming from okay. a home recording, it'll be mm-hmm. not great. And you can't assume that, oh, it's coming from a professional recording studio, so it'll sound fantastic. Um, it completely depends on... I see. I see. Yeah, the, every, mm. everything the 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 performances, the material, the artists. Mm. Not so much the gear. I have to say, you know, um, I think you can get amazing results with very very affordable gear these days. Um, and I mean, again, I've heard stuff from you know where I know that people have incredibly expensive um, high end gear, and it still doesn't sound great. Um, so you know that. I, yeah, it, that's a red herring in my opinion. It's. Of course, it's nice to have really expensive, really nice gear. I'm not, gonna, you know, not going to knock that at all. But it's not a requirement, um, especially not now with this more technology. how you use it rather than the gear itself. Is, is that what you're saying? Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, yeah. the unofficial mm. catch line of my uh, catchphrase of my my um, home mastering masterclass course is: uh, "It ain't what you use; it's the way that you use it." Um, and I, yeah, I, uh, I firmly that is that. right on, right on. Yes, <laughs> I, I love that. I love that. Okay, really cool. Um, look, um, a bit earlier we had a little diss uh, um, uh, on, on you know the e mastering services and and spoke about what a professional mastering engineer can do. But even professional mastering er- engineers do get things wrong at times, and there was a time when uh, everybody fell for this collective madness of making everything a little bit louder than the other record. <laughs> Uh, which we all know these days as the loudness war. And uh, I believe from all the mastering engineers that I'm aware of, you're probably the most vocal one against uh, the loudness war. Can you can you comment on, on what's what's wrong with loudness? What, what's wrong with loud masters? Well, no, there's nothing wrong with loud masters at all. Um, I mm. think the, the problem is when it becomes a competition or a war, as you say. I mean, I love mm-hmm. that you, you mm-hmm. spoke about it in the past tense, but I'm, I'm afraid from where I sit, it's still very much um, in play, um, which is particularly frustrating because there's no real... Even if you thought there was a benefit to being loud, these days most people won't get to hear it. We could come on to that in a minute, perhaps. Um, But, no, I mean, yeah, I 
I love loud music. Everybody loves loud music. Um, and there, the reality is that if you play somebody two versions of a, a song that are identical, but one of them is slightly louder, the chances are they will say that the louder one sounded better because there is a yes it's a it's a, a psychoacoustic effect it's something that our brains do it's not to do with the sound itself um nobody mm-hmm. really knows why but louder music m- sounds tend to sound as though they have more bass and more treble and it might be an evolutionary thing i i always make this joke that um you know maybe it's because for a caveman um the jaguar that is or a saber-toothed tiger, I should say, that is breathing down your neck um, about to eat you is much more important than the one that's 100 yards over there um, stalking a herd of gazelles. So your brain prioritises the sound that is close to you because if you react to it, you're more likely to survive. That seems quite credible to me, Um, but it may not be the real reason. Oh, I love that. Um, But the the, the fact is that um, we tend to prefer louder sounds um so yeah, yeah you know mastering engineers have known this for ages even if somebody brings you the most amazing mix in the world if you turn it up slightly it'll sound slightly better t- to them and they'll think they're getting their money's worth except mm-hmm. there's always a limit to this stuff you know w- amps have a maximum gain speakers have a a maximum level you can push them to before they start clipping and eventually you know shredding tweeters and stuff and particularly in digital formats you know with with analog tape you used to be able to push the levels up and it would start to kind of softly saturate and it would get a bit, you know, kind of blurry and mm. crunchy and, you know, the transient would be, transients would be softened and actually that could sound quite nice sometimes or certainly quite appropriate to for, some degree, for some yeah. material. Mm. Mm. Um, digital clipping is much less forgiving. Digital clipping um, mm. tends to sound very brittle, very harsh, very quickly, um, especially, especially when, you know, you get beyond just the odd transient and it's cutting into musical signals like a, you know the, the tone of a bass guitar or a vocal or whatever um so yeah you know in every piece of audio software you have this zero db um indicator at the top of the meters and if you push that into the red the chances are it's not going to sound great so you add extra processing you add compression and limiting to try and bring the level up and not hit clipping and that also can sound good in moderation and sometimes even in excess but you know it's it, i always talk about i have this analogy that i call the, the the loudness cliff you know if you imagine um you're pushing a boulder up a mountain um and you want to be on top of the mountain where everybody else is as well so it takes a lot of effort to push the boulder up to kind of two-thirds getting up to close to the top of the mountain and then you get towards the top and it starts to level out and actually it's not that hard anymore you can push it but you're not getting very much you know you do the same amount of pushing and you don't get that much higher um then you get to the top and if you push it just a little bit too far you go over the other edge and get smashed on the rocks below <laughs> and it for me it's the same <laughs> with audio yeah, you don't want to be yeah. too quiet you know you, you it wants to be loud enough um Mm -hmm. and actually there is some benefit to using that compression and limiting the processing to achieve that kind of loudness it can help glue the sound together it can help with consistency it can help with translation which means you know it can help it sound the way people expect on a wider range of systems um and then you get into what i consider to be the sweet spot which is the top of the mountain but you push it much further than that and then you just start getting damage you know and Mm. it can be subtle to begin with um, you know, if you imagine the mountain kind of just rolls over a bit and it just starts to go down slightly, you don't really notice too yep. much. Um, and then beyond a certain point, you know, it's it's it's, it's all downhill from from there. Yeah, right. Um, mm. So, so the, the so loudness you're there's was some kind of a sweet sweet point there. Absolutely, that, I'm that all you need about, to find. And if if you push it even further, then you get past it and it actually gets worse. Exactly. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, mm. I'm I'm all about finding. The loudness sweet spot. I mean, for me, mastering is all about balance. It's not about matching. You don't want to make all the songs yep. sound the same or be the same loudness. Or you know, it's everything is unique and wants to be treated as as the best it possibly can be. But it's about balancing things. You know, you you want a quiet song to be a little bit quieter than a loud song. You know, maybe certain sections of the loud song you want to be even more intense. Um, so there's mm. there's balance there, and then there's balance in terms of finding this loudness sweet spot where it's loud enough to translate and to stand up against everything else there and to sound right 
for the material, you know, to, to, to feel right in the, in the genre, to achieve the, mm-hmm. the emotional impact you're looking for, um, you don't want to go any further than that. And the problem with the loudness war, so to come back to your question, is that this idea has grown up over the years that louder is always better and that you need to be at a certain loudness in order for people to like it or for it to sound right or for it to sell loads of copies. Um, and that creates this pressure on people that they feel that they, they need, you know, we ought to be making it however loud. Um, and that's where I have a problem with it. That's the bit that I'm outspoken mm. about. Because especially today, where most people hear stuff for the first time on streaming services, and on streaming services, they turn really loud stuff down so that users don't suddenly get blasted by really loud songs because um, that, that gets them complaints. Um, even if you make something insanely loud nobody's ever going to hear it that way you know above a certain point everything gets reduced in loudness online almost everywhere um and so it's completely fruitless so you know when the war in air quotes started back in the i guess mid 90s that was the era of the cd changer you know where you might go Mm -hmm. into a a bar and they would have 200 cds in a like a like a like a jukebox you know, and somebody could yes. go in and dial in a song. And in that mm. situation, maybe there was an advantage in being a little bit louder than everything else so that people would kind of go, oh, what's that? You know, you kind of cut through the, the conversation and, and stand out from the crowd. That, mm-hmm. that just doesn't apply anymore. Um, but people, yeah, there's this, I mean, I still see it, you know. You, so, so these days we, you're able to measure loudness. That's actually quite tricky to do. But there's a, a thing called the loudness unit or the loudness unit full scale, um, which is shortened mm. to LUFS, L-U-F-S. Um, L-U-F-S is a, is a way of measuring loudness. And you'll hear people saying, oh, if you're on CD, it's got to be at least minus nine L-U-F-S because L-U-F-S is also measured. Mm-hmm. It starts with zero at the top and it goes down from there. Um, and, you know, just minus nine, that's really loud already because that's an overall value for the song. And, you know, you can go down to minus 90 or something. <laughs> Um, maybe, mm-hmm. maybe not quite that low, minus 60 in terms of loudness. Um, so minus nine is right up at the top of the... And then there's people who will say, oh, no, if it's EDM, it's got to be minus eight or minus six or minus four. Um, mm. And people have actually done research into it. You know, I mean, I I kind of always say that's not true. And people go, prove it. And I say, well, I don't have to because there's people who have done... You know, they've plotted graphs of the loudness of hit records over the years and they found that there is no connection to sales, you know, Listeners don't care. They want a song that they can that moves them emotionally or makes them want to dance or laugh or cry. You know, they, they want something. Yeah. They want the music, and they don't care about the loudness. Uh, they they genuinely don't. So it's that's another thing that I find sad is that it's it's very much an obsession of musicians and engineers. You know, the people who care most about the music have fallen. Um, have been deceived by this idea that it has to be super loud and they end up making it louder than it needed to be because they think it's necessary and they don't realise that really nobody else cares much. <laughs> you know, I mean, as I say, it needs to be loud mm. enough. Um, but if it's too yeah. loud, it'll get turned down. So just do what sounds right for the music and so don't worry about if, the numbers. If it, gets turned, if it gets turned down later, you said if, if somebody makes it really loud and pushes it past that sweet spot... And now you're getting negative side effects. So what happens if it's turned down by the streaming service? Are these negative side effects still there? Yes. That's that's the sad thing. If you... Mm-hmm. When I'm working mastering, I mean, you know, the, yeah. nobody's perfect. You said yourself earlier on, we're all human. So even as a mastering engineer with 25 years of experience, over and over again, I, I start work on a project and I probably start with the first... I mean, I... I skip through the album to get a sense of the range of material that's there but then i tend to start at the beginning so i'll take the first song and i'm I'm mastering i get it to a point i think oh that sounds great um and then what i always do is compare with the mix before i had done whatever it is i'm doing it with and because i know about the loudness deception and i don't want to be thinking that what i've done is better just because it's louder i always well these days you mentioned right at the top i use my perception plug-in which just automatically measures the the before and after loudness and balances them so then i can do a comparison it's like okay how does this sound different without having to worry about the loudness and not Mm -hmm. always but still quite often i'll get to that stage and it's like yeah i went a bit too far (laughs) 
Um, <laughs> it's, you know, it's there's mm. not quite as much impact, or it's maybe it's a little bit too bright overall, or it's a little bit crunchy, or you know, and the great thing then is that it's easy. I can just ease back slightly on my settings, usually come up with something that sounds even better. And then that time when I do the AB comparison, the before and after comparison, I'm like, yeah, my master sounds better than the mix, which is my goal, you know, or well, I want it to sound as good as the mix and I want it to be the best possible version it can be. It doesn't have to sound better, but um, often I do think it sounds better. Um, And, that's not because of the loudness. That's it. Just objectively, you know, it sounds more glued. It sounds more consistent. It sounds, you know, the the dynamics mm-hmm. are working better. The chorus really hits now. I can really hear that kick drum pumping through. Whatever it is that that I'm going for. Mm. So in that case, I've spotted the negative effects, and I've adjusted them at the mastering stage, so they don't end up in the master, right? And so then that version can go out, and people can play it however loud they would like. And it's going to sound as good as it can on that particular playback system. That's the goal. Okay. If I hadn't mm. done that process, if I had gone with my first impression, which actually was a little bit on the hot side, when that gets uploaded to the streaming services, they will turn it down. But it's just a re- re- level reduction. They don't change anything else about the sound. So all of those negative yep. things, that's like crunchiness, that maybe the pumping, or maybe some distortion, or it just all sounds a bit flat mm. and a bit held in and a bit you know that the chorus doesn't quite kick it doesn't have that space and that yep. that life to it that's still going to apply it's just going to be quieter um and if you okay. take an extreme where something is super loud and it gets turned down often it can actually sound quite a lot worse than other music because yep. this is the other thing right once the loudness deception is taken out of the equation once you're hearing stuff at a similar loudness level you hear much more accurately what's happening. That's why I do it when I'm mastering, so that mm. I don't fool myself. Mm. But these days, you know, people listening on streaming are not going to be fooled by loudness. They're going to hear the songs exactly as they are. And that's why I encourage everybody to go for balanced dynamics. You know, it doesn't have to be super dynamic. Yeah. Like I say, I, I love mm. loud music. I love loud sound. I'm, my goal is to make people's loud music sound loud, but also sound great. Got it. Mm. Okay. Look, um, about a year and a half ago, I worked with a client and we, I mixed an album for, a bu- album for them. And um, then the band leader um, figured out that there are quite a few uh, mastering houses out there who offer a free test master. So he took one of the mixes and passed it to, I don't know, two or three different mastering engineers and got them all back. So... When he listened back, he just put him, dropped him pretty much in his DAW and hit play. And uh, I noticed that they were quite significantly differently loud. And going back to what you said earlier about how we perceive volume differently and how something louder seems better, uh, I wasn't really surprised that the one that he perceived as loudest was the one he liked best. But if I understand what you said correctly, it was actually not the best thing to do. He, He should have balance the volume out first before making that call is is that correct to say that's my what's a good way what's a good way to compare two different masters or two three different masters in this case well How, how would you do that well okay so two answers to that personally i okay. would measure what's known as the integrated loudness so it's the lofs value and it's a single number for a whole song Um, And I would match the songs. So if one of the masters Mm -hmm. came out as being 2 dB louder, I would turn it down by 2 dB, and then I would make my comparison. Mm -hmm. Um, And I have a... a, And that's before you hit play, is that right? That's before I hit play. Well, no, I would probably listen to the raw loudness first. I mean, I think both are valid and important, Mm -hmm. you know. But the reality is we're not in the early 90s anymore. Nobody really Mm -hmm. is going to listen to this in a CD changer kind of way. Um, There are some websites. There's Beatport and there's... um, I think Bandcamp and SoundCloud do not yet turn down the loud music. The, the process is called normalization. Loudness normalization just means kind of evening mm-hmm. things out, making it more normal. Um, mm-hmm. So those sites, which obviously are important to independent musicians, don't turn down the loud stuff. So I think it is important to know how much louder everything else out there is, you know, when, when you're comparing and to in- factor that in. So I'm not saying loudness mm-hmm. is completely irrelevant, but I would also... <clears throat> measure and match the loudness and do that comparison yes. okay. because that will enable mm-hmm. me a to pick out whether there are negative aspects of the louder um songs that 
on reflection, I'm not so happy with. But also, mm-hmm. you know, if there's a louder version that sounds just as good to you, even when the loudness is the same, then why not go with that? You know, the, that's great. Mm. Um, the second way that you can do it, um, and of course I would say this, but is to use a website that I developed with Metaplugs. So Metaplugs are the company that I uh, develop my plugins with. We created a free website called Loudness Penalty. Um, it's at loudnesspenalty.com. And anybody can go there and you you just drag an audio file onto the browser window. It doesn't get uploaded. Um, all the processing is done in the browser on your computer. So it's completely secure. Nobody is listening to or storing the music. Um, and it will tell you what adjustment to the level will be made to that song on a range of streaming services. So it might say, oh, it'll be turned down by mm-hmm. 2dB on YouTube and Spotify and Tidal. It'll be turned down by 4dB on Apple Music. Um so and then you can preview it i mean the numbers are interesting but the important thing is you can then press play and hear it with that adjustment applied and then you could open one of the to use your example you could open one of the other masters in another tab in the browser do the same thing with that I and see. preview that mm. so then you don't have to worry you don't have to understand loudness units or have a loudness meter or measure any of this stuff um just open yeah, as right. many tabs as you like you can even compare it to you know, providing everything is going through the same sound card and you've got all the volume controls set to, to zero, you could compare it with other material on Spotify, for example. So you could choose, okay, how will mm-hmm. this sound in terms of loudness on Spotify and then play a couple of reference songs nice. that you really like yep. from Spotify. And that will tell you before you upload how the stuff is going to sound and you can then make that mm. an informed decision about, uh, you know, am I happy with how this sounds once it has been normalised, once it's been... Um, well, changed to the distribution loudness mm. of the service you're on um, because they, they all that have a, a point really where good they, idea. Yep. That they don't go any further. Yep. They'll turn loud stuff down. I love that uh, workflow. I've used that website to, to come up with the measures, but I've never used it to actually listen back in a normalized fashion. Mm-hmm. That is actually really smart. Look, I'm going to put um, the link to, to um, loudnesspenalty.com into the show notes. So if you get to the end of the episode, please scroll down, click it, and then bookmark that straight away for your productions. Great advice for listeners. Thank you. So going back to um, my client who had a couple of different masters at hand, some louder, some some quieter. Um, if, if they were to go on CD, chances are they probably would choose the loudest one. But, but what about streaming services or vinyl or radio? Would it make a difference there whether they pick the moderate or the really loud one? What's your take on that? Um, th- there are different answers for each. Um, okay. I mean, first thing I would say is that it's not necessarily the right approach to choose the loudest one for CD. Um, mm-hmm. Because the reality is people who listen on CD, the chances, even with all of this, I mean, one of the other crazy things about the war is even with all of this going on, there's a big difference in loudness between stuff that gets released. I mean, if you take something like, mm-hmm. um, you know, the, the the Daft Punk album from a few years ago that everybody loved the sound of so much, that was mastered significantly quieter than a lot of other stuff around the new album by tool was mastered by bob ludwig and Mm. overall was at minus 14 lufs which is quite a lot quieter than most you know aggressive kind of progressive metal is mastered at i mean just to return to my previous point that had no influence Mm -hmm. on the success of those albums at all but let's say you went from listening to you know something super loud and then you put one of those cds in the first thing that you do is adjust the volume that you're comfortable with it. You know, if it comes on, it's a bit loud, you turn it down slightly. And if it's a bit quiet, you turn it up. And people are used to Mm -hmm. doing that. um, And they always do it themselves. So even though there's no computer algorithm making decisions about loudness on CD, the person listening to the music makes that decision. So, and as soon as they've done that, Mm -hmm. the advantage or disadvantage in inverted commas or in air quotes of being louder has gone. Right then, it's exactly as if they they I had see. used their own yes. personal version of the loudness penalty website. So, <laughs> yeah. I, as I say, yeah, if, you, if, if you find a loud version mm-hmm. and it still sounds mm-hmm. good to you, even when it's loudness matched, I don't see that there's any harm in using mm-hmm. that for the CD release. Um, mm. But so, uh, what about radio, for example? Well, okay, radio is the most complicated. I was going to do vinyl next mm. because okay, okay, that's good. If, then if, do vinyl first. Yeah. So, vinyl is <laughs> kind of simpler because there are physical limitations in the vinyl format that have to be taken account of when the cut is made, which determine how loud something can be cut onto the record. So, for example, the longer the playing time of the vinyl, the lower 
the level has to be because basically you know a vinyl is a, a groove cut in the in the plastic um, you have to be able to fit enough grooves onto the record to get the running time that you want um, so the longer it gets the less space there is for the grooves so the the smaller mm-hmm. the grooves have to be and therefore the quieter it is cut um, so really the digital level that we've been talking about is not strictly relevant when it gets cut to, to vinyl the cutting engineer is always going to adjust that um, and mm. I'm not a cutting engineer, but I know uh, several really great vinyl cutting engineers, and they all agree that actually they can get better results with more dynamic material going in. So not this super loud, super limited loudness war mm-hmm. uh, sound. They can cut that sound to vinyl. There's just no benefit. And actually, it's harder for the cutting lathe to trace those aggressively limited waveforms accurately. You end up getting extra distortion and the vinyl doesn't sound as good so that's a pretty Mm. simple one radio is really complicated because it depends (laughs) um so (laughs) in the u.s there we go again yeah in the u.s and in (laughs) europe there are well in, in the u.s there are regulations and in europe there are guidelines for broadcast about loudness um so for broadcast for tv you actually have to submit at certain loudness levels and if you don't the music will be or the material will be rejected so that's one aspect on radio um the loudness will probably be adjusted and the question is how do they do it Mm. Um, if you go for a, a little independent radio station um there might be no adjustment it might be exactly as it comes off of the the cd or out of the file um other radio stations might use something similar to the streaming services where they measure the loudness and even it out to get a more consistent result. The the big commercial radio stations and you know stations like the BBC here in the UK will use what's known as broadcast processing. So um, these days radio is going digital, but back when you had analog radio, um, everybody wanted their signal to be good and loud for areas that had poor reception. You know when you're radio station mm. buried in the in the noise and the hiss so they used yep. broadcast processing so they have automated processing strapped to the output before it goes to the transmitter that evens out mm-hmm. the loudness of everything and it quite often does it quite aggressively and it quite often changes the sound yep. quite dramatically and those processes are still in place and some people use them to get a a signature sound for their radio station. So there are presets like the, that come... The and, Auburn processors and so on. The, exactly, yeah. the Optimods um, yeah. and, mm-hmm. and similar. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, people at the radio stations in that case are using those processes creatively to change the sound of what you send. Um, so, so the question in is... In simple to, terms, they just throw another compressor on top of it, uh, which probably has one setting there's no engineer who fine-tunes that it's just sitting there everything goes through the same processes is, is that how it is that's that's how it is and okay. the mm-hmm. evidence is based on my tests usually the louder the stuff goes in the worse it sounds coming out at the end now mm. the, all of this processing is getting more sophisticated so i'm not going to say that's set in stone but i guess you know the I said it depends, but probably a more accurate thing to say is it's complicated. Um, <laughs> yeah. It depends, you know, Surely, yeah. there's mm. very little control. Because you, obviously your music might get played anywhere. And if it gets played on, mm. but okay. I think for me, the, the answer is always go for the sweet spot. Because then you're yeah. making the music sound the best it can be. It's as loud as you can get it without any negative side effects. So mm. that means if it gets played back on a radio station where... Um, they're not evening out the levels it's still going to be in the right ballpark Um, if it's played on somewhere where they're using some kind of automated system like the streaming services then it's going to work really well Um, and if it's going through some kind of broadcast broadcast processing it's also going to sound great and it's not going to get too badly mangled in the process whereas if you put in a super loud Mm. version it's going to come out sounding even more crushed and lifeless and distorted and all the rest of it wow okay it truly is complicated, yes. But uh, but the answer so is simple, right? Really, which is which is yeah, yeah. aim for the sweet spot. You know, try and get the perfect balance yeah. of loudness and dynamics, and don't be tempted to push it mm-hmm. super loud because um, it's probably going to backfire. Mm. In that my opinion, really, really smart. You know, wise words. Um, what is your prediction for the future? How is the loudness uh, industry, the the playback industry, going to change over the next couple of years? 
I think I would be foolish to make a prediction. I have, <laughs> I have, I have hopes and I have fears. You know, okay. um, I hope that over time, more and more people will realise that it's not necessary to to push for extreme loudness. There's no real benefit, and will choose to, you know, pull things back a bit and master produce mix record master their music with more balanced dynamics um and that they can do what's best for the music you know rather than thinking mm. oh you know i mean one example for me is country music um i saw a, there was a discussion online just in this past week about the number one country album in the u.s being almost as loud as uh death magnetic by metallica which is a famously super oh, really? loud album an album that's so loud yeah. that the, the fans complained and started a petition asking for it to be remixed and remastered um now it's not actually as loud but it is really loud at the loudest sections and i just listen to it and think is this musically appropriate you know does this make sense for the for, for the art mm. was it necessary um so my hope is yeah. that you know people will stop doing that they'll stop feel, feeling pressured into um doing things that are not right for the music just because somebody says they should or they are afraid it won't ha- they won't be able to sell copies or that people will skip their song or something um and just start doing what's best for the music um and the great news is that because you know normalization this this process of turning down the louder songs is here to stay it's only going to get better it's only going to improve it'll get more sophisticated it'll get mm. more clever it'll get better results and that means we have creative freedom to to genuinely do what's best for the music and not have to worry about loudness right. for, for its own sake. Mm. That's my hope. Um, my fear is that that won't happen, that the, the myths will persist, you know, that people will continue making... I mean, you know, one of the sad things that's happened is that some people have heard their music not sounding as loud when they when it gets reduced in level by Spotify or YouTube or whoever. So they just do another master that's even louder. Um, and they just they just keep going and piling it on in an attempt to to kind of fight that system. So there's, there's a kind of negative aspect to the the whole thing there, you know, where it's it's really not helping. Um, so, you know, I have another reason to be hopeful, which, funnily enough, has to do with this new feature on Apple devices called Apple Spatial. Um, there's a lot of excitement about it last year. They are you kind of get this 3D immersive sound. On, I mean, it's on Android as well and, and other systems, but Apple have really kind of gone with it in terms of publicity. Um, and obviously there's a lot of people using Apple devices. Um, and yeah, it's all about 3D immersive sound, um, trying to get the feeling of surround sound, even if you're just listening on headphones. Um, and the interesting thing about that is that the, the music is being delivered in a format called Atmos, Dolby Atmos, um, which is a kind of an upgraded version, if you like, of, of Dolby surround sound that people might remember. Um, and they have specified that these masters can't be too loud because it messes up what's possible technically in terms of... Because you have this format where nobody knows where it's going to be played back. Is it going to be played back in a movie mm. theatre on 36 speakers or in somebody's living room with... 14 speakers or just on a pair of earbuds yes so to have that yes. flexibility mm. to prevent to provide the best possible playback experience on all those devices they've said here is where the loudness needs to be and the result is that engineers working in that format can do stuff that is much more dynamic so it's got to the point where most of the time i will now choose to listen to the dolby atmos version of a song if there is one on my um my phone rather than the stereo version just because it's likely to have more dynamics um and it won't be super super loud i'm hoping lots of people will do that and then everybody will start thinking well okay well if we can go and have some decent dynamics there let's do them in the stereo mixes as well you know why make these two versions yeah. well, let's let's just yeah. have better dynamics everywhere so again that's my hope that's my optimistic um outlook but I well, fingers crossed. Well, yes, I was going to say I, whether I could predict that or not. And sadly, I'm not sure I can. <laughs> but yeah, fingers crossed. Let's hope. Okay.
Excellent. Look, um, may maybe the very last question. If people are now curious to learn more about you, and maybe want their record mastered by you, where, sh where can they find you? What's the best place to, to get in touch or follow you? Uh, they can go to my website, which is productionadvice.co.uk. Um, if you click on the About tab there, you'll find my contact details, or you can search for me uh, on social media. I'm on Facebook and Twitter quite a bit, so people are welcome to connect with me there. Um, if you want to hear more of this kind of stuff, you could take a listen to the Mastering Show podcast, which is available on iTunes and everywhere else you can get podcasts. Um, I have warmly a, recommend it. Oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> I have a, a YouTube channel where I put videos out about all of this kind of stuff, kind of giving practical demonstrations and advice for people who, who want to try out some of the things that we've been talking about. Um, yeah, so it'd be great to hear from people. Ian, thank you so much for your time today. All of these uh, places I'm going to put in the show notes, of course. So if you have no excuse, uh, click the show notes, scroll down, click the links and check out uh, Ian's fantastic work online. Thank you so much for sharing all your wisdom with us today. I really appreciate that. No, thank my, you. my pleasure. I enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. Mr. Ian Shepard on the Production Talk podcast. Thank you so much. That was absolutely phenomenal. I hope you all got something valuable out of today's episode. Uh, mastering, as we all know, is this magical black art. And uh, Ian did an amazing job uh, demystifying it and showing us uh, the limitations of what can be achieved in mastering and also give us some fantastic suggestions on how to overcome the downsides of, of uh, loud masters. Since you're here, you're definitely into podcasts, and I just wanted to point out that Ian also has his own podcast called The Mastering Show. You'll find it on every single player that I'm aware of. Uh, just be aware, it can get very technical there. It's a place where uh, Ian speaks uh, about in-depth mastering stuff and uh, parts of it are very technical but it's a lot of fun so maybe just check it out uh, i enjoy it a lot and i listen every time if you want to reach out to me you can do so via my website mixartist.com.au where i offer music recording services on the east coast of australia and of course online mixed on services for clients worldwide I'm looking forward to hearing from you. In the meantime, have a fantastic week. I'll speak to you soon. Bye for now.